and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. And today, we start China. We do China geography and early politics. <clears throat> so, China's at the eastern edge of Asia. So, what does that mean? It means it's not connected for a long piece of its history to the other major civilizations we've already talked about, to India, to Mesopotamia, to Egypt, to Greece. So that means in some cases it's behind, in other cases it's advanced because it has to invent everything itself. It has to come up with a lot of its own ideas. It doesn't have the advantages of, say, a Babylon, where you have all of these cultures coming together and you have this mix. China is so far away that even in Alexander's time, people didn't really know China was out there. It wasn't on any of the Greek maps. And so it's not going to be till later to the Han create the Silk Road to create a connection across Central Asia that connects China to the, to the other major civilizations. So it's behind in some ways, it's advanced in others, but it's isolated. It has two rivers. So this is good, again, for, for China. Uh, we've seen two rivers in a bunch of places. It has the yellow and the Yangtze. The Yangtze is spelt Y-A-N-G-T-Z-E. -E. The yellow is in the north. The Yangtze is in the south. And China will be between those two. So in a way, it's a Mesopotamia itself. Chinese civilization is going to be between these two rivers and then expand out from there. So what does this do? Well, two rivers equals a lot of water. Water equals agriculture. Agriculture equals cities. Cities equal uh, trade. Trade equals money. Money equals knowledge. And so two rivers is usually better than one river, except if it's the Nile. The Nile is always trumps more than one river. And so we have a wealthy connected society we also have a core group because you're living between these two rivers so everything between these two rivers is going to be in some way shape or form china and it's going to be just like between the two rivers becomes mesopotamia so it will share a similar culture a similar language a similar art <clears throat> three china has a problem and that problem is the Western and Northern nomadic barbarians, the horse lords of Central Asia. Whereas the horse lords have a tough time getting to India and will occasionally invade the Middle East, they are constantly invading China. Geography just leads to it because if you're traveling east and you hit one of the rivers, the yellow and the Yangtze coming out of the Himalayas, you just follow it. And if you follow that river, you're going to wind up in, in China's civilization. You're going to hit those cities. And so there's this constant invasion of um, nomadic peoples who are going to come in. They're going to burn stuff down. They leave. They settle. They get absorbed into China. And so there's this constant, uh, unlike the other civilizations that we've had, there is for China a constant give and take with the nomads. So much so that what China will do is build walls to try to keep them out, especially on their northern frontier. And those walls don't work. They didn't keep the Mongols out. They don't keep the Huns out. They don't keep the Manchus out. They, do, they don't work. Walls don't work. Economics and armies work. And so you have China that's isolated from the other major civilizations. It's developing on its own. It's wealthy. It's got two major rivers, so it's wealthy and developed, but it's also under constant conflict and constant invasion. So what happens to Chinese imperial history? Well, like India, you have a long period of time where uh, we can see a pattern that happens that presents itself again and again and again. And what we start with is one China. China will unify, somebody will come along and unify the two rivers, unify those Chinese cities. What happens then is that family or person or dynasty or whatever it is gets weak, dies out, and China breaks up into pieces. Now, unlike India, which break, because geography separated people, 
divided people between a north and a south. India breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. But China, on the other hand, because there's these two rivers and everybody lives between them, has a unity to it. And so what you get is a state called the Warring States. You get a period called the Warring States where everyone fights to reunify China. So unlike India, where India is unified by a foreigner, China will be unified by Chinese peoples. Will be unified by uh, Chinese one of uh, one dynasty. The idea is not should there be a China. The question ultimately is who's going to run it. Of course, there's a China. Now we live in the Warring States period. Now, since 1945, we've lived in a Warring States period. We, you can make the argument that it's even before that, but um. There are, we live in a world of two Chinas. We live in the Repu in a world where we have the People's Republic of China, mainland China. When you think of China, when you say, I'm going to China, you mean the People's Republic. But there's also the island of Taiwan, which calls itself the Republic of China. Is a large United States trading partner, is a member of the UN, is trying to be independent of China. And China says uh no you're part of us now for the last 60 years there's been a debate who is the real china who will take over as china in 1972 the united states said yes mainland china is the real china for the first 30 years it was um we said taiwan was the real china but there's still what we have is the one china policy where the united states says yes there is one china but it's up to the chinese people to do this to un unify peacefully but there was up until 1989, there was the debate that Taiwan might take over China. And the idea was communism would collapse and Taiwan, which was a new becoming democracy, would have the political parties that could then go to mainland China, set themselves up and win an election. And with that, bring Taiwanese democratic capitalism to mainland China and take over culturally, if not militarily. What happened was um, the Chinese Communist Party saw what happened to communist parties in Eastern Europe, saw what happened with Tiananmen Square, got scared and basically gave a carrot and a stick. The stick was Tiananmen Square will shoot you if you protest. But the carrot was leave us in power. You'll get wealthy. And since 1989, China has become the second largest economy in the world. Yeah, uh, 900 million people have come out of poverty. But still, we live in a world of two Chinas, just like we live in a world of India breaking up into pieces. So if there's going to be a war, if there's going to be a war in a Taiwan Strait, and the United States Sixth Fleet, I think it is, is right in the middle of that. <clears throat> so how do you run China once you unify it? The answer is the mandate of heaven. This is actually invented by usurpers, by, by rebels who revolt against the, the, who revolted against the dynasty, took over and said, um, oh yeah, we, the, the reason we got to take over was, uh, the, the gods, the heavens no longer supported the previous dynasty. So it's kind of a might makes right idea. And it's the mandate of heaven gives you legitimacy. And what it does is it gives you absolute power. You get to do whatever you want. And yet it's not quite absolute because you have absolute power, but you have to use it to protect or improve the people. There's the caveat. You could do anything you want as long as it's to protect or improve the people. And the Chinese Communist Party today uses this a bit. They don't call it the mandate of heaven, but the idea is, can we move 10 million people to build a dam? Yes. Why? Because the dam is going to provide, it's going to flood out a valley and destroy millions of dollars worth of property. It's going to put it all underwater. But what is it going to do? It's going to create electricity that will help a hundred million people. So yes, so are some people inconvenienced? Yes, but it will help the vast majority of people. So that we are, we can do it. And it's this idea of protecting and improving the people. You have absolute power. You can do whatever you want. And yet there's a limit on that absolute power. And finally, four, you could see it in nature. So how do you know if you have it? Well, you see it in nature. This, there's a European, medieval European idea. 
that you could see a good king has has a good land, that the health of the king is reflected in the health of the land. Uh, so King Arthur is this is, has this when King Arthur is new and young, uh, the crops are good, the rains are fresh. The trade is good. People are making money. Babies are born. Cows are born and they, they're fine. But when after Guinevere has her affair with Lancelot and breaks uh, Arthur's heart and King Arthur takes the bed and basically goes into a huge depression, um, gives up on life, basically England starts to fall apart. Cows are born with two heads. Crops die. There are no rains. Or if there are rains, it, it, it's poisonous rain. Everything, the land is poisoned. So there's that idea. The second idea is that bad things happen. Hurricanes happen. And we see this with Katrina. But a good government can fix those problems, can recover. A bad government cannot. George W. Bush, was seen as not helping the people of Katrina. So the Republicans were seen as bad governors. And in 2008, they lost. They lost everywhere. Every Democrat who ran in on the national ticket won. Because between Katrina and the economic collapse in 2008, Republicans got stained as the people who made problems and can't fix them. So you see this idea in nature that when bad things happen, government serves people in trouble. Government has to come in and help people. When there's a giant earthquake, government has to come in and help those people. If it doesn't, why doesn't it? It doesn't either because the government sucks and is mean or is so incompetent it can't. Either way, people don't want that government. And what that loss of legitimacy means is revolution and the coming of a new dynasty. The warring states, China will break up because lots of people say, oh, I can run China. And so China breaks up into those warring states where, where four or five, ten different families say, I can run China. They fight with each other and sooner or later, one of them will win. So in our next episode, we're going to talk about Confucius and Confucian philosophy. Thank you.